Let's see what's out there. Hello and welcome to Home Media Minefield presents Let's See What's Out There, a weekly video stream and podcast currently focused on Star Trek Picard Season 2, which is available for streaming on Paramount Plus and Amazon Prime. I'm Keith Isles and as ever I'm joined by Pete Mealy. And we are both film and television enthusiasts. And for this bonus episode, we are delighted that we have a guest uh, joining us. Um, last week I mentioned in the news section about a animation of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, a scene from The Best of Both Worlds, which was animated in the style of the original animated series of Star Trek. And um, yeah, the, you, I've since been in touch and we're really delighted that uh, um, Justin is, is going to join us from Gazelle Automations to, uh, to talk a little bit more about this. But the thing I'll say before I bring him on is if you have not seen this, it's about a two and a half minute clip. If you've not seen it, pause this video now. There's a link in the show notes below. Click on that, check this out, and then come back to us because it really is um, something quite special. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, get that out of the way first. But it gives me great pleasure to welcome the co-founder of uh, Gazelle Automations, as well as the animator for this Star Trek piece, Justin T. Lee. Welcome to the show, Justin. Hey, guys. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, that, that's Thanks a very Star me. Trek name that you have there. <laughs> the, how's that? My, my name? Yeah, yeah. You, you the T. Is it is it for Tiberius? Yes, or absolutely. I think <laughs> I've just told everybody over my life that it's just for Tiberius. It's obviously for Tiberius. <laughs> um, no, I just I have a very common name, and I was just like everybody. Like, I remember going to the library at the school once, and they I forgot my library card, and they said, "Oh, it's okay. Just tell me your name, and I'll find you in the system." And there were nine other people with my name. So I was like, I, I got to use the initial. I have to. So, uh, yeah, T. Well, lucky, I, lucky for yeah. you, it's a T, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, and also, um, that splash screen was that you found a picture of me and you found, like, holy moly. <laughs> got the logo on there. Yeah, we try and, we try and do the homework. And uh, mm -hmm. as, as I said, it, it, we, we only gave you a shout out, you know, just because it was Star Trek news and we felt that people needed to see it. But, um, you know, this is literally a bonus episode having you on to uh to, to to talk the journey through with us so we really appreciate you coming on um, well, thank you for having me amazing before we get into gazelle automations and what what you do there and obviously the the star trek next generation piece could you tell us start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your history with star trek prior mm -hmm. to this just in general um, I bet you like with a lot of people, I watched it since I was a kid and, um, I'm sure it won't surprise because I was born 87. So it's next gen next. I, I think I was, I was born the year the next gen started. Yeah. 87. Yeah. So that was on. And obviously we watched it. It was like the, um, the, the grownups show, you know, like it seemed very <laughs> adult and serious. And so, and it came on late for, you know, us little kids, but, I just thought it was like the cool adult, like my dad watched it and uh, you know, like it, sometimes it kind of creeped me out. Um, but that's the show that I kind of was. And then of course they were rerunning it all the time. So we were able to see, um, I think actually only recently have I been watch have I watched TNG in order? Cause like growing up, I'm sure like maybe with you guys, it was whichever one was on. Right. So you would see them all out of order, which I guess is kind of what, syndicated tv used to be so like it would just and it was designed that way so you could just pick one up and you wouldn't need any kind of context but um uh, and then you know voyager came along and that was when i was like a teenager so it was like i was really i really was following voyager um but yeah my, tng was kind of i feel like for a lot of people my age like tng's the it's like the warm fuzzy blanket it's like you know just like very uh, comforting and and still holds up yeah Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you're you're in the same camp as Pete. I think TNG was your uh, entry point, wasn't it, Pete? 
No, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger. So uh, I started watching the original series. Uh, but uh, uh, sorry, did I say younger? I meant older. Um, <laughs> it's the same thing either way. I was, yeah. I was yeah. born earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and so I actually remember the TNG premiere. Wow. Uh, and it was event television, right? Like my entire family sat down to watch it. Did yeah. you, given the fact that you were a fan of TOS, like, did you, when you saw Farpoint, do you remember what your reaction was? Did you go, yeah. like, what, what loved, is this? Oh, you no, loved I it. I thought it was great. Oh, that's awesome. I was all in. I thought that, uh, you know, uh, like, I remember right away being like, oh, instead of a Vulcan, they have an Android. Right. Um, and uh, and then I, I remember, you know, Wesley Crusher was uh, there for, kids like me right right because yeah it was yeah he was uh i guess he was like 13 14 and right i was seven when it came out and so it was like aspirational um and yeah yeah i just remember being all in it was the best that's super yeah. cool that you took yeah. to it right away because i also know i'm sure you guys know trek fans who have never seen next gen they like as soon as it came on they were like that's not star trek and they just never watched it so yeah that's, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm I'm clearly the oldest here. I mean, I'm not quite as old as Star Trek itself, but um, I grew up with the Star Trek movies. You oh, know, yeah. they were, they were oh, sort yeah. of my entry point. And as a result, they reran the original series and the animated series, which we'll obviously get to. And um, I, I know what you mean. I was already a teenager by the uh, by the time Next Gen came around. And um, yeah, I, I you know, it took me a while to warm to. Uh, to, to the characters uh I, you know I, I really like the visual effects and the updated enterprise and all of that yeah. stuff but it, it did you know that first that first season of um next gen even for me now is 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 still a bit problematic i'm, I'm oh yeah hi. oh <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a bumpy ride it's definitely a bumpy ride there's some, there's yeah. some there's some good episodes in there and i think um even upon recent rewatch we thought oh yeah these are good but then there's a whole lot of Naked now. Oh yeah. God! Oh God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just... Oh my goodness! And you just think, yeah. I, I mean, that's why shows kind of like it's great when shows have that ability to do several years before. You know, I think I was just reading an interview with um, might have been like Michael Pillar, where he was like Gene Ronbury asked him to stay on for longer because he was like, look, the show's just getting starting to work and that's like the third year right and some a lot of shows mm -hmm. don't even make it to the third year so yeah. it's kind of interesting they had to do like two years of trying to figure out what to do with the show and then finally hit something that worked and then and then it really worked like yeah you know yeah. season three onward it was just like it took off yeah yeah so so you 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 obviously then started with next gen and, and you followed on with voyager and deep space nine yeah were you into um, those shows you know it's funny it's like I don't know if you guys are like this, but like DS9, they were advertising it while I was a kid. Every time I saw the ad, I thought, how interesting. I know a lot of fans probably thought this. Like, how interesting could it be? It's set on a space station. They don't have a <laughs> ship. They don't go anywhere. How interesting could it be? And for years, I didn't watch it. And then one day, one fateful day, because I, I love DS9. I mean, DS9 is awesome. Uh, one fateful day, I don't know why, but I was flipping through channels which people used to do and um the visitor was on you know the ds9 on oh, the yeah. visitor yeah. that's the that's the first episode I saw. and and so and i happened to catch it just as it was starting i'd never seen it i didn't know what it was and after i watched it i thought if that's what deep space nine is i'm all in and then i watched it from the beginning and just watched the whole thing but, yeah 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 and never i'd never i always thought it was going to be a bore um <laughs> And it's far, far from. It's like I think it might be my favorite. Uh, it might be my favorite series. Really? Okay. Maybe. Uh, what about what about Voyager? Then Are you uh, are so you a Voyager apologist or? or uh, uh, like... <laughs> and I don't want to say any, I don't want to say anything to to polarize anybody. But it's um because uh, my wife and I are doing a a by star date Star Trek viewathon, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So we, we started on TOS and this is taking us years because we don't watch one every day. So like whenever we have time, we'll watch one and we're doing it in order of star date. So right now we're flipping between uh, Voyager and Deep Space Nine because that's where we are. 
-hmm. So it's sometimes we get like one and one, or then we do three DS nines and one Voyager. And I have to admit, it kind of shows that like the deep space nine writing team is like really on fire. Um, and it, everything's gelling and Voyager is pretty damn hit and miss right now. Like, it's kind of like, we've got three bad episodes and then you get one good episode. And, but, um, but I mean, the, the, the casts of both shows are really good and when they hit it, they really hit it. Um, so we enjoy it. But I think if we're honest, like, especially my wife, Lindsay, she's like, Oh, I just like deep space nine is just, I'm just having more fun with it. So that's, um, that's great to hear. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and did you, I've got to ask, did you, did you start her off with enterprise? So we didn't, and I'm trying okay. to remember why that is. Um, Cause the chronology we're actually following. I don't know if you guys know this, there's like a Star Trek chronology project. I've been trying to figure out who exactly put this together, but there's a website and it's all done by Stardate or, you know, guest Stardate. Um, and obviously those two Enterprise episodes, um, the Mirror Universe ones, they fell because of the, the Tholian web. They fell into the lineup with TOS. So we did watch those two, which right. which Lindsay found extremely confusing. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No context. It would be very confusing. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but at least there was the kind of the aesthetic through line you know the the right. ship look the way the way the ship looked the costumes all that kind of stuff um uh but yeah. in terms of the like i know we're, we're kind of approaching in our our viewathon um the tribbles episode of deep space nine which is exciting because she's seen uh, right. the tos one um yeah and everybody loves that episode rightfully so it's ridiculous yeah um, and you'll have you'll have the flashback episode of voyager as well yeah yeah yeah. So, yes. Uh, yes yes um, Keith, you said you're a Voyager apologist, so you you do you do have a soft spot for it, I guess. Oh, I, lo I love yeah. I love Voyager actually. Um, yeah. It was weird when I when the oh god, I'm sounding ancient now, but when Voyager was out, I was actually at film school, and oh, yeah. um, basically uh, it was an easy. I loved Star Trek anyway, but Voyager was an easier show for me to see because I was quite busy working on film projects, and I was you know, I had a part-time job in, in the theatre and, you know, stuff like that. So it was much easier to dip in and out of Voyager than it was um, Deep Space Nine, which yeah. was, of course, a bit ahead of its time because it, it was much more sort of story arc based and, and, mm -hmm. and you, know, you know, you had the Dominion War and all that sort of yeah. stuff going on. So um, weirdly, you, you know, I found at the time Deep Space Nine a little bit harder to connect with. I've, I've since... Yeah watched it and 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 love it also but um yeah yeah and then of course enterprise which yeah. which both pete and i that's how pete and i connected oh, over cool. enterprise actually a big fan of that but of course that was pre star dates that was when jonathan mm -hmm. archer was just literally giving the captain star log of the yeah. year that it yeah. was you yeah. Know? yeah so so um yeah it's a tricky one to and the chronology i think it was originally done by michael okuda sort of back in the okay. 90s mm -hmm. but since then uh i don't know who's been maintaining it and whether they've been including new trek so so i take it as your wife is, is she seen any new trek yet then no and we're we're kind of like i'm very wary of because i i believe surprise is good like she, right. she's like, whatever I, if I know, but the thing is it always, I'm always proved right about this is when, when it's a surprise, it's, you know, the getting to experience some of the Star Trek surprises through her is really fun because I already know what's coming and she doesn't. Um, so we've not like, cause even like a prequel show like disco, like they, they're making references to stuff that she hasn't seen yet. Right. So we're being careful about even like we have a book, like a Star Trek, the next generation 365. And she wants to read through it and I'll go through a page and it'll have like a reference to like the, the finale of DS nine or something. Go, okay. You can't read this yet. You know, there's a lot yeah. of, um, and I know these shows are all old now and you think like spoilers is like, it's a long time past, but I still, I want to kind of keep it, you know, she hasn't even seen first contact yet. Like that's coming up, which is well, exciting. Okay. So you didn't, you, 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 so you've doing them. So did you include the movies in the marathon? Yeah. Then? Yeah. 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 Oh you yeah, did them in the in the in crowd. order. Yeah, so we did just watch like not too long ago. Generations came up, right? And we and we saw then the Enterprise crashed, and then of course Worf turns up on 
Deep Space Nine and Cisco says, I heard about your ship and it all makes sense. So it all kind of, yeah. and you know, the Duras sisters show up on Deep Space Nine and then there they are in Generations and it's kind of all. I love to those, those Berman years, you know, for what anybody says about um, Rick Berman, you mm -hmm. know, it, it was it was tight back then, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the continuity was 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 good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's just it is fun to watch it this way because we've I've never watched it this way before. And even just watching um, the next generation in order, like was really interesting just to see how the show evolved because I'd never done it before. Um, yeah. Kind of seeing when the writing got sharper, when the actors kind of felt comfortable, um, you know, and even there are character arcs, of course, as we know, but they're just kind of, they're not as emphasized so that it can be syndicated. But like even Wesley Crusher's story arc, like he had an arc and that's not yeah. something that I'd ever fully experienced until I watched it in order. So, um, yeah, it's super cool. I can see why, Keith, why you, you Voyager w would have been like kind of the easier thing to kind of. I feel like maybe that's even why when I was younger, because maybe I missed, I might've missed an episode of Voyager now and again, right? And it didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was that. But I mean, the other thing about Voyager and they didn't quite sort of stick to it, but um, I did like the fact that, that Voyager existed in a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they were light years from, from home and, and they had to get back, but they, they kind of, um, they didn't really, you know, the conflict with the marquee crew and the the, the problems with the ship and the, <laughs> the lack of shuttlecrafts and torpedoes and all of that soon became sort yeah. of irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, what yeah. a shame. It was yeah. kind of it was kind of um, Stargate Universe was, right. was the show that, uh, that that I think Voyager could have been, if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. And, and also, I, I almost wonder, again, I don't know this at all, but like the behind the scenes thing is you had this Deep Space Nine show that was um, serialized, that was very heavy, very dark. And, you know, you had TNG that went off after seven years and people loved TNG, right? Like in Toronto, where I'm from, when they did the finale, they did it at like the giant sports stadium. Like everyone turned up in costume. It was a huge deal. So I feel like, again, I don't know for sure, but maybe people at at paramount we're like we need to give the audience more tng which is kind of how i feel voyager became it was like very quickly yeah. the two crews were getting along as you said the torpedo problem's gone the shuttlecraft problem's gone um i even saw like what was it might have been robert beltran or one of the actors said made a joke about how you know they're supposed to be like kind of short on food and stuff on the ship but each year they got a little bigger and they had to like you know <laughs> loosen their uniforms and so like all those things kind of got put to the wayside about like their their predicament but um yeah but anyway i still have a I, 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 I know they wanted to do I, I i don't know whether it was ron i think ron moore was more involved with deep space nine so it yeah. might have been brannon bragger but they did want to do there was a really great episode of voyager called we will get back on track in a minute, yes. by the way. But there was a great, great episode called "The Year, The Year, Year of Hell." Oh, I love, um, that episode. love that episode. Yeah. Yeah. and and they wanted, but I think the studio wouldn't let them. They actually wanted to spend a a season oh. in that year. Oh, so have, it... have everything wow. getting grubby and mm -hmm. you know losses to crew and. Yeah. You know, all, all, all of the problems that they were going through in that they wanted to sort of have. But, um, yeah, I don't think Paramount at the time wanted to take the risk with that sort of thing. And we kind of had a little bit that sort of thing, I guess, in Enterprise Season 3 mm -hmm. with, the, oh, yeah. with the Zindi arc and the Expanse and all of that. Right, Pete? I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess it does. As you said, it's like it, it reflects the changing kind of dynamic of, of TV. It's like to, I, what you described, Year of Hell, a whole season of Year of Hell. Today, I feel like they would do that. Like they yeah. would go, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Let's do that. But then it was like, what if somebody turns up four episodes into the season, have no idea what's going on, right? You know, and they were, yeah. or they, or a station plays them out of order, which would be even worse. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so, I mean, you're clearly, you know, from just from this conversation, you clearly love Star Trek and, mm -hmm. you know, but, with your wife, did you did you cover the animated oh, series? Yeah. Then in oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Absolutely. It was part of the chronology. I mean, it's it's canon now. And uh, well, I think it is. That's what I read anyway. But yeah. no, that's either, what they said. Yeah. Either, either way, like it was definitely part of the, you know, five year mission. 
and you got you know the same people there and um and it's kind of got his own wonderful quirks about it the animated series so even recently if we don't have time for a full star trek episode if it's late sometimes Lindsay just says let's just put on an animated episode it's le- it's way less um commitment you know yeah. like and if you fall asleep it's okay we've already seen it you know so and some of them are great some yeah of them are yeah some yeah, of them. yeah. You know what? Um, the second episode, it's too bad it's so early in the run, but yesteryear with um, Spock going back in time. Yeah, I yeah. actually, I will admit, both of us tear up watching that one. It's yeah. just a beautiful episode. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. It's so well written. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And I'm glad it's canon. Okay, I'm, I, you know, like I said, this channel is all about giving shout outs and sharing the love, if you like. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but have you seen Star Trek Continues? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you have? <laughs> okay. Because we, we've, we've had Vic Munyanya yeah. on the show, before, well, on, mm-hmm. on another show we did. But yeah, a uh, big fan of that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I always think that the animated series falls in between each episode of... of um, Continues. Continues. And yeah. then it kind of makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I've definitely kind of, I've, I've been telling some other people I've talked to as well that a lot of fan stuff over the years, I've just, you know, because I am a fan. So I've seen fan films and I've seen like different fan projects and stuff. And it's always interesting to see what um, fans are up to. I'd never made anything for this fan base before. Uh, this is the first time. But yeah, I've been definitely like keeping, you know, I've seen other people's animated series episodes and I've seen... Um, yeah, like continues. I've seen phase two. I've seen like a whole right. bunch of stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. But by the way, Pete, sorry, I feel like I'm doing all the talking. Please jump in if you've got a question for Justin, because otherwise I'll just keep going. No, this is, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm here because uh, I'd be listening if I wasn't here. So uh, I'm having <laughs> a good time. And I feel like I'm talking too much. So I want to throw it back no, to you. No, guys. No. Oh, no, no, no. You're the guest. guest. You're yeah. the guest. <laughs> yeah, we, we want you to talk. So, okay. Well, Obviously, we're going to get into the the specific um, project, but before we do, I you know I had a little look around Gazelle Automation's website, mm-hmm. and uh, you got some interesting stuff. Did, so, do you want to sort of tell us a little bit about Gazelle Automations, what you do, um, how it came about, and all of that sort of stuff? Yeah, um, I, I so we started um, in twenty. 20- 16 i think that's when we started our company and i've worked in tv for i guess my whole professional career Lindsay's worked in tv her whole professional career um, my background is in animation and visual effects and design and so um i did a lot of work on like yeah film tv music videos like um visual effects compositing designing stuff and animating characters and all that kind of stuff so that's what i did before and i still do that um, then in 2015, we went to the UK and Lindsay and I were, um, one of the, two of the key people who made new episodes of 1960s Thunderbirds, which is, I'm going to point over it. Yeah. So we kept some of the puppets. Um, so that was, um, that was for ITV's 50th anniversary celebration of that show, which was, came out in 1965. So we made three new episodes in the style of the original sixties show which actually is another reason why I found Star Trek Continues so fascinating because it was coming out at the same time we were doing this. And in both cases, you're trying to kind of lightning strike twice thing. You're trying to like capture that feeling of the time and, you know, light it the same way and all those kind of things. So we were doing that. Um, And we even had some of the original crew from original Thunderbirds working on it with us. So it was a very interesting experience. And then we learned all this stuff um, while we were doing it, like how to, build sets and how to build puppets and like these are things i came in um primarily to kind of supervise art direction and i was going to puppeteer and Lindsay was there to puppeteer but then we also there was a dear friend of ours who unfortunately is no longer with us and he um he was i'll put it this way his first job in the industry was working on r2d2 for the empire strikes back that's where he started in the industry so he knew and he worked on like all the new bond films he worked on all the new Christopher Nolan, like the Dark Knight trilogy. He'd worked on all those films. And he was kind of like that guy you wanted on your crew because he could do everything. And instead of keep those secrets to himself, he imparted those kind of trade secrets and the confidence onto Lindsay and me 
because we worked with him a lot during Thunderbird. So we came back to Canada and thought, what, wouldn't it be so terrible if these skills went to waste? Like if I just went back and sat at a computer and did my animation, or whatever. So we, we set up this company and we started, you know, making stuff with puppets and miniatures and animation. And so that's kind of what our company does. Um, and our first big show called Meekshi just came out um, on TVO Kids, which is a Canadian broadcaster. Uh, that was just September. So it's still pretty recent. It took us four or five years to make that show, which we started by ourselves in the back of a pizza shop. We literally, our landlord, the pizza guy carrying pizzas through the shot. Um, like we'd be filming and he'd be like, oh, just, and he'd like carry the pizza to the back door to like do a delivery. Uh, and then we ended up partnering with a production company here and it ended up getting expanded into kind of an action adventure series, which we just finished. So, um, so that's kind of like the, and we're now working on a bunch of new projects. And this Star Trek thing was honestly just for fun. I just did it because I was like, this would just be something fun to, I just wanted to see what this would look like to have a TNG, TAS thing, remix, merge, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Oh, and thank you. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I see you've also got on your website something you, you're involved with something to do with short circuit. Is that right? Oh, that, no? that, where is it? That, that thing is one of the props from the second movie. That one. Right. And which I, was Kenneth Johnson's film, wasn't yeah, it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. second one, which was filmed in Toronto. And right. so um, that, um, that was a neat, cause like when we came back from England, like we had all these new skills like painting and casting. And like, there was all these things that we could do that we couldn't do before. So my friend had this, this guy, cause my friend worked on the movie. He was one of the puppeteers. Um, he did the arms for the pup, for the robot. Wow. And so, he um he had like they apparently all the the um key crew got to keep one of those guys because like i think they had i don't know 25 of them or whatever um so he he told me that it was kind of broken and he yeah. found that, that i kind of had a childhood <laughs> that's putting it lightly i had a childhood obsession with johnny five so yeah. you know this kind of came out very organically and then he said would you fix it for me because it's broken and all like some bits were missing and stuff so um, I worked on this with uh, a friend from a, like a builder community um, who kind of helped CAD the missing parts. And then we, you know, painted them up and put them back together. Um, and then I, uh, I told my friend, I was like, how badly do you want this thing back? Because uh, I kind of want to keep him. Yeah. So we've, we, we, we've, we came to an arrangement because like it's, it was, it's been so many years since he, he also worked on the Ninja Turtles movies. And like he's done a whole bunch of stuff, right? He's a puppeteer. Which right. is why, um, well, which is why I know him is because we have like there's a puppeteer community in Toronto. But um, yeah, this that film hilariously was also filmed the year I was born. So there's like some kind of 1987 yes. thing going on. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And and I've got to ask as well because I'll have friends of mine that will be very disappointed if I don't bring this up. It also says on your website that you're somehow involved with Doctor Who as well. Yes. So I, I'm not a doctor who guy but i've got lots of friends who are so yeah <laughs> i i'm not i have to choose my words carefully i'm not the most the hugest doctor who aficionado like i don't i haven't watched grown up watching it but an opportunity came up through my friend chris cassell who's another vfx artist um to basically they were putting out uh, classic doctor who episodes on blu-ray the bbc yeah. and this was like a well one of them's not even out yet um and we um, we redid the the effects for those episodes, and right, but done in a way. And this is very important. The direction came from the, from the BBC, and I also we said the same thing. We we're like, we don't want our effects to look like the year twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two for a story from nineteen seventy nine, right? Like it has to look sympathetic. So right. um, we tried our best, and hopefully the fans like it, what we did to you know like if people are shooting laser beams we referenced star wars we referenced wrath of khan we referenced like stuff of that time and yeah. did the work in that methodology so you don't have effects that would have been impossible and then all the ship stuff um i i used the model shots as like the source material to make the new shot so i didn't cg from zero which is i feel like not the for me it's not the right way to do it so right um and hopefully, I think, I mean, the BBC dudes seemed happy with it, which was nice. And so we did two two stories, which I think is six episodes total. 
which yeah. was a was a neat um, project to work oh, on. Just, yeah, this is this is all so bizarre because because even though I say I'm not really a Doctor Who guy, the classic Doctor Who, yes, you know, I grew up with those ones because um, mm-hmm. they were a similar timings to Star Trek. In yep. fact, you know, yep. um, a little bit earlier. In fact, I think Doctor so. I was already on the fourth or fifth Doctor by the time I I was seeing them as a kid. But oh, so you probably was, saw the episodes that I worked on then. You, maybe well, when they, this, yeah. This is the thing because obviously Home Media Minefield, this channel, yep. were actually about you know physical media, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and here was the thing because there had been the only for for years the only doc because they BBC did some really good DVD releases of Doctor Who, the classic Doctor Who mm-hmm. stuff, and the only. For, for years, the only episode that had been um, released on Blu-ray was, uh, I think it was a John Pertwee episode. Um, oh, God. Is, people are going to be shouting at me that I can't remember. the. the Pete, Pete the you name. know what it is, right? Don't you, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's Spearhead from Space or some, something like yeah. that, the t- title. And, and the, the only reason that had been the one put onto... Um, blu-ray or it was because that one was entirely shot on film uh-huh okay? yeah, yeah what they used to do with with classic doctor and again we've got really off the point i know but what they used to do with classic doctor who is they would any location work they would shoot on 16 yep. mil film mm-hmm. and then the rest of the stuff was shot in a studio on on video, video yeah. and, and shot like a almost like recording a stage play kind of thing and you know, the problem was that there was no way of of making the video stuff look high def, you know, for mm-hmm. um, 1080 or, or or anything. And then suddenly uh, the, the, the line of work I work in, one of my customers uh, was called Pixel Logic. And they were producing these Doctor Who, um, Tom Baker, you know, and I was like, hold on, how can you do that? Because yeah. it's impossible. And they said, oh, yeah, but there's new software that uses AI now mm-hmm. to actually create more pixels. So you can es- essentially take something that was recorded on VHS and make it high def. And yeah. I was like, that just blew my mind. Yep. Completely blew like, my like mind. Like high def in quotations, but it's true. Like yeah, where, but... where the upscale technology is today is certainly a way better than it was several years ago yeah Yeah. and and i mean the doctor who episode we worked on the real downside of it was because it was shot on video originally at at 25 interlaced frames per second yeah i just worked on an episode called time lash and this is a notorious episode because i think it's notoriously known for being terrible um and you've got this like portal that the actors are walking in front of right because the original shot at 25 interlaced frames per second if you do the work correctly as we did you basically have to rotoscope 50 frames per second. So that's what I did, which like st- started to make me slowly go insane. Because <laughs> oh, like, there's so many frames. Like usually when we do work, we're working at 24. That's usually yeah. when I do animation or whatever. But this was 50 frames per second with actors walking in front of this thing and tracking it and uh, camera tracking. Um, but uh, again, hopefully the fans will. This one's not out yet, but hopefully the fans will like it. That's amazing. I remember w- when some of them came because I did get, you know, as me said, I'm not really a Doctor Who fan, but I did. I did buy some DVDs of certain episodes that I remember from a kid, and they used to have the option where you could watch it with new visual effects or the mm-hmm. original visual effects. And I thought to myself, I so wish they'd do that with the Star Wars movies, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so- yes. You know, I, again, I don't know. Disney's not, not <laughs> Disney's not listening to any of this because the fans keep saying this but if they just do a you know re- restoration of the theatrical version i will buy it like right away like yeah i you know just it's a product of its time i really do believe it and and just to be clear for the doctor who stuff it is an option on these new blu-rays it's right. an option which i totally am for it's like you can watch and you know what I, you you guys going back to star trek we watched tos on our trekathon on blu-ray that's how right. we watched it um and we we i'm s- sorry to the people who did the revised effects but we left them off like we yeah, watched well, the original I, that that's great because the blu-rays are literally the and, and the old dvds are the yeah. only ways now that you can have you know you can see original series of star trek with the original visual effects because yeah. whenever they're broadcast anywhere because they've been optimized for high def and whatever now they use the new, you know, the 2006 right. um, 
you know, special edition effects, yep. which of course people always say, oh, wow, you know, the, the, the people say it looked bad, but the effects weren't that bad. And I'm like, yeah, that's because it's not the original effects, that's, that's, guys. It's that's computer generated. That's computer yeah. generated. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 we just wanted to have like, again, product of its, excuse me, product of its time. Um, we listened to the mono soundtrack. Like we just had everything kind of the way it, you know, just because I'll be totally honest before we did this as part of our trackathon, I hadn't seen most of TOS. Like I, again, I grew up watching TNG, right? So this is my first yeah. time watching TOS um, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I think I, we really understood why um, people love this show so much. Like the original show, it's like it, the, the, char the characters are really loud um mm -hmm. everything's really colorful and then you know and certain episodes were like really great yeah. you know we were like really had fun with it yeah mm -hmm. no absolutely absolutely oh, i'm glad you got us back to star trek what one thing i will say before we leave the thing is if b i hope bbc if they're having success with doctor who i want them to do it with blake seven mm -hmm. that's a mm -hmm. whole nother story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i know you're not the only one who's saying that so <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it all depends on like how this stuff is selling and all that kind of stuff. But um, I know the Doctor Who stuff, like I just posted one picture from Time Lash that we worked on and there was a lot of um, reaction to it. So I guess they're obviously the fan base is big mm -hmm. and international. Um, I'm just not particularly familiar with it. But but again, I did my research before mm -hmm. I worked on those episodes. I watched them, learned the context, like where it was in the story, the year it was shot, all that stuff. So that it wasn't just kind of phoning it in absolutely yeah. the opposite yeah. yeah no i was i was always as a kid i was always more of a blake seven kid than a doctor who kid but uh pete yeah. have you seen blake seven no i'm either. american i don't yeah. know either i don't know this either oh, and I, know, I was, I was no. gonna say that probably keith it, is the only other person on this call who knows what thunderbirds is right because thunderbirds is yes not a, nope. i have yeah, no idea what it is I mean, exactly yeah but, but thunderbirds it, it Okay, Thunderbirds really was before my time, you know, yes. before yeah. my time. But I was very aware of it because, um, you, you know, some of the vehicles uh, were made into, you know, corgi toys and yep. stuff in the seventies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did, I did sort of catch them on Saturday mornings in reruns and stuff. And and it, and you know, have huge respect for Jerry Anderson and Sylvia Anderson and what they did and everything. But I was never, I was never. Um, I don't know. I like live, you know, even though yeah. the, the puppet stuff was clever yeah. I, I, and the and the ship designs and everything were amazing. But it never really I think by the time I did see it, I was probably um, you know, older. Too, yeah. A bit too yeah. Old. yeah. And um, you see, the one the one I never saw that they did, which was live action, was Space 1999, which which I need to get into. Which and, is which I think watch. is that's got kind of international popularity, right? Because I know there's a lot of fans in like the U.S. who like it, and you yeah. know, yeah, I, I I have to admit I've never seen it either. I, I well, I I've seen very little because again, that was sort of uh, before I. Mm -hmm. you know, be it just didn't line up with me as a as a as a kid at the time, um, even though it was being rerun at points, but. Um, to bring it back to Star Trek, though, yes. interestingly, Star Trek. Star Jonathan Trek. Frakes directed a live-action movie of Blake Seven. Uh, a Thunderbirds which wasn't very good. A, a, a <laughs> Thunderbirds, Thunderbirds, right? Yeah, a Thunderbirds. It was, sorry, right, yeah. right. Um, Pete, yeah, sorry, did I say Blake Seven? I yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you've got Blake Seven on the mind. Thunderbirds. Pete, um, yeah. Pete, the one thing that makes, I guess, Thunderbirds and all those kind of shows that they made, there was like a studio in the '60s that made all these science fiction shows with puppets. Yeah. And, and, and model miniatures and the kind of big sci-fi relevance or filmmaking relevance is all those, a lot of the people that worked on those went on to work on Star Wars 2001. Yeah. yeah so like, that's kind of, it was like where they learned how to do that stuff. And then they took those skills and, um, yeah. you know, used them on all these other properties that, you know, everyone's seen. So it's kind yeah, of, it was like the Genesis well, place. For that. Even George Lucas references it because of course, mm -hmm. everybody always says Flash Gordon, you mm -hmm. know, obviously with yep. the Star Wars, right? But actually, um, you know, Thunderbirds was, was a, uh, was a touchstone for him as well because Makes you know, sense. he would have grown up watching that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So, um, but yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I thought cool. the, uh, your character in blue there, I was like, Oh look, he's got a 12 inch doll of Alexander um but uh <laughs> that is not a i guess i need my eyes checked oh i i see why because alexander yeah. was always wearing a blue jumpsuit that, right? that would be and it looks like he's wearing a klingon uh, right, right 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 the ball uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 that's a good have, idea 
It was yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, what is it? Scott Tracy or something? It some, is. Some it is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Love yeah. it. Well, I suppose we better talk about the, um, uh, you, you know, the the oh, animation. Yeah, yeah. Before we do that, I'm, I'm just going to share a oh. screen here because, you know, I, I want people to understand that the love and I, you know, you're going to tell us, but yeah. I can see what a labor of love this is. And what I've done is if I just go to this. So cool. for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, sorry if you're listening on a podcast, but basically what I've got to hear is a, a slide and I've got the three images from the top are images taken from the original animated series, which was made in the 1970s. And the three images at the bottom are the images that Justin created for this little, you know, next gen animated clip. And you can just see from those two images. I mean, man, you did your homework. You know what I mean? It's Amazing. like incredible. It's uncanny. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. That means a lot. So so tell, tell us about it, how it came about. And um, yeah. I know I know that these were hand drawn, right? Yes. Like original animation. So. so that that is kind of a, a key part of it. Um and again, I I've I've said this before, like I don't want to I'm certainly not like my thought about animation and how to approach it, especially for this project. I'm sure there are other animators out there who have other ways to approach it, but the way I did it and what wanted to do it was to do everything as much by hand as possible because I think there are lots of um you know, when they do 60s or 70s or 80s style animation today, and I'm sure you guys can think of examples of this, like for a little gag in a show or a commercial or something like they do, like, you know, Hanna-Barbera in a bank commercial. Um, <laughs> it's usually and I know part of it's because of cost. They will use, you know, modern day animation, not just the digital tools, but the techniques of today to expedite the process of doing that. And one of those things, I think a real telltale tale sign is um, sometimes called tweening or you know motion interpolation or whatever, where you have like a piece of artwork and you kind of slide it around, you know, you hinge it on a, you know, it's kind of more like paper cutout animation. And right. in cell animation, while, and it's hilarious because we actually did just watch an episode of TAS last night and yeah, they would sometimes slide the cell. So you'd have like a drawing and they'd slide yeah. it this way or they'd slide it this way. But they wouldn't usually have an elbow joint and they would slide it like this. So you would do a bunch of different drawings if the arm was moving or if it was sticking out or whatever. So that was a big thing. I thought if I'm going to make this look legit, I have to draw everything by hand and, and let the computer catch all the imperfections. Like don't use a quick workaround for this. So um, usually when I do animation for like professional jobs, um, I don't do that because it just, the time isn't there to do that. So I would do something where you draw the character once, have it jointed, and then you, you know, animate the joints. So, so that was a big thing I was stickler about uh, and ended up making, it's funny because a lot of people have said about this cartoon, you know, it looks just as cheap as the original and, and, <laughs> and yeah, in the, no, and, and, and they mean that in a nice way and I right. get it. But the funny thing is, like, for one guy to do it by themselves, it actually was a lot of work, like surprising yeah. amount of work. So um, even when you try to be really budget about how much the character moves and all those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when, when the when, I mean, when the Star Trek movies came out when I was a kid, they would rerun the original series, but also at weekends, like on a Saturday morning, they would put on the you know, the filmation cartoons, you know, of, of the animated series of Star Trek, as well as it was around the same time that the movie Flash Gordon came out. Mm -hmm. And there was also Filmation also did a um, Flash Gordon animated series, which is actually rather good. I have to mm -hmm. say the story and plot of that one was was awesome. And um, but the animation was very similar. It, it yep. did look, uh, you, you know, very similar. And I think it even used because they 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 used in house music, right? Yes, because, yes. Uh, they didn't want to pay royalties to Alexander Courage or whatever, and um, uh, you know, again, you lifted that music for this, which, right? Which is that amazing. was <laughs> that was kind of like one of the first things I I thought of when we, this project started to gel in my head, which was probably months ago. Right. Is we during our trackathon, here we were watching we watched TAS, 
we were on Next Generation, and at some point my brain thought, wouldn't it be funny? Because TAS takes itself seriously, as it should. But you yeah. can watch it inside as a serious story, or you can watch it from the context of, look how kind of funny this is. <laughs> because it's, you know, because of the budget animation, because like sometimes, you know, two Spocks run at the camera by accident, you got those kind of animation mistakes. But you can watch it both ways. And I thought, what if you took something like a really serious moment, a really pivotal, um, memorable, identifiable moment from the next generation and did that treatment to it? What would happen to it? Like, what would it be to hear that TAS music over a TNG scene? So that's kind of what got my brain thinking about it. But then months went by where, you know, and I told Lindsay and she said, oh, that would be so funny and so mm -hmm. wonderful. And again, it, I, I keep saying funny and whatever, but it, it's just, again, as an homage to Star Trek and how much we love it, wouldn't it be so cool to, um, to, to see, see something like this? But I kept thinking it's way too much work for one person. Like, it's just for this one idea, I was like, it just seems too impractical to do it. And then Lindsay went on a trip. She was actually in the UK. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, like a few weeks ago. And I was at home between jobs and I thought, okay, well, what if, if it was her birthday on April 2nd? And I was like, I'll surprise her with this because she kept saying she really wanted to see this. And all I had done by her birthday was just the opening title screen. And I think one bit of little bit of animation. And then you could hear the rest of the soundtrack, which was like the music over, you know, Frakes and Patrick Stewart and whatever talking. And I sent it to her and she immediately said, you have to finish it. You, you just have to finish this. So, um, so then I did, but, but so, it was like, yeah. So, I mean, it, cause the clip itself is what, it's about two and a half minutes, three yeah, minutes, not even two and a half, I think it's two minutes and 10 seconds or something like that. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, how, how, to put, to give some context here, how, how much, how long did that take? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it was somewhere around like a full week of work that wasn't wow. like not within a week, but like every time I had time to work on it, I would just, and I think it added up to about a week of work. Um, I think it was something like that. And I definitely like probably should have taken more breaks and stuff. Cause like my arm was like, <laughs> you know, you have like drawers, you know, kind of cramp or whatever, just from like cramps. right yeah. drawing that much, yeah. um, which I usually don't do like to have to. And sometimes when I'd hit a shot and I go, Oh darn it. Like the, the character has to like turn like this. I go, I've got like 15 drawings to do. And I was like, Oh no. Right. But um, I knew if I did any shortcuts, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah. So I mean, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I watched your, I'll, I'll also put the link to that down there. You you have a little, a, a short featurette where you kind of explain about what you did. And what I found fascinating was you, you even, you even added like dirt to the frame oh, yeah. and stuff that would move as well. Like, because yeah. they used to peel cells back, right? When they mm -hmm. used to do it hand drawn back in the 70s or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um uh, so, so you tried to emulate that as well, right? Absolutely. I think this is where our work on Thunderbirds and our work even on Doctor Who kind of it all informed the way I approached this. Because like when we did Thunderbirds, most of the way we did it was the way they did in the 60s. But there were certain things that were just too impractical. So I would use digital yeah. tools to help. But the, always it starts in my head with how would they have done it and why would that have happened? So if we're, using, we're talking about optical printing, which is, you know, obviously people don't do that anymore. Um, what are the way, how did that work? Why did they do it that way? And then what were the artifacts that came out of that process? So, and then I did Doctor Who and it was the same thing. It was like, now we've got film telecinied onto video in the 70s. So that has to, you have to go through that process to create the visual. And then TAS was, this is shot on, I'm 99% sure it was 35 millimeter. I think it was 35 millimeter for TAS. So they're shooting on 35 millimeter with exactly as you said, you've got these cells on the camera, like the rostrum camera pointing yeah. down with two lights on either side. I think that's how an anim animation stand, like the pictures I've seen, they've got like usually two lights and you can see it on TAS when you watch that the, the, the characters are casting shadows, right? Mm -hmm. Slight shadows going left and right. So that I added, like just so that the cell looks like it's above the background just a little bit. And then if you've got an arm moving, that's another layer. So you've got another shadow there. And right. then, of course, yeah, I'm imagining these guys at Filmation, um, probably like 
puffing away at a cigarette. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how I like to picture it. <laughs> and you know, the, the cigarette ash is getting all over the artwork and it's all in the air. And so they pick the thing up and there's all this dirt on it. And then they, you know, and they have to finish really quickly. So they're just putting the thing down they wipe it off and then they take the picture or whatever. So that's the way I was, um, I was constantly thinking about how that would like, what it would actually be like to do that for real. Um, Love it. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And then the other the other thing I want to ask you about is um, if I get the image back up here again. Um, so, you know, the, the Borg cube and, and, and some yeah. of the costumes and stuff, you, you deliberately, you know, coloured um, in a sort of pinky purple shade yes. rather than yes. grey or black. And again, that, that that was kind of a trope of the TV of of the animated series, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is an interesting thing, and I've seen. Um, I mean, I'm so shocked by the reception of this thing because, like, I haven't been able to keep up with the, the the comments. But when I've been able to see what people have said, there's both people. I think a lot of fans got it right away. This purple pink thing, because mm -hmm. if you know the animated series and you've seen it, you'll you'll know what that is. But there are also, and people who are kind of, um, there's been this rumor for a long time that the reason why there's pink and purple where there should be gray in, in TAS is because um, one of the uh, senior art directors or director, or whatever, is colorblind. Um, yeah. As far as I know, that's not true. And oh, really? I, and no. Okay. And, and a lot of people, there's been discussions that came out of my one post of this cartoon where people are kind of contesting that and saying that's absolutely not true it was just a creative choice and i don't oh, see why it couldn't just be a creative choice because it's just a funky cool you know and especially for like a cartoon of the time you'd want yeah, something yeah. really kind of that pops like that um and yeah like i've kind of heard I, like both stories but i don't think it's true i don't I want think, to go on record I, about anything i think and i'm i might be wrong because i haven't yeah. watched it in a long time but i think obviously i've got the the animated series here, the, uh, mm -hmm. the DVD set. And one of the things I loved about it is some of them have got commentaries on some of the episodes, mm -hmm. but they've also got featurettes behind the yes. scenes about the writing and about the creation. And I think that that story might have been told on the disc. On one of the featurettes. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. And I think it's yeah. DC Fontana that tells it. And this right. is this is why, because um, the 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 guys at Mission Log podcast, the Roddenberry podcast, they yeah, yeah. they weighed in and said, no, it's just a rumor, and it's made worse by the fact that DC perpetuated the story. That's wow. not true. I don't want to get on one side or the other, but either way, it was like the, I'm the, I'm trusting Keith over Norman and uh, John there. I, yeah. I don't know, I don't know, but like I all I can say is, from an art perspective, when I thought of this project, the the um the cube being that color was one like maybe the first thing that came into my head i was like i like that absolutely has to happen because that's what it would be you know you have klingons wearing pink and purple and ts you yeah. have aliens in pink and purple and i was like okay the borg are pink and purple 100 percent, 100 percent. you know so it was um, part of the charm of it anyway yeah. i kind of liked it but um, yeah and but... then yeah to your point like all the colors i had to really think about um color palette because i didn't want you know and, and my thing is kind of this weird mishmash of like 90s trek and 70s trek and i still wanted it to feel like the 70s despite the fact that i changed the copyright date on the thingy so <laughs> i so that so like all the the color palette choices had to be informed by tas and just kind of making sure that it felt like something they would so if you see behind picard that obviously on the re, the real d bridge is like a beige color yeah. But I tried that and it was like, it didn't look right. So you end up going for something kind of more like you see like the cool colors. They use this, these blues behind Kirk on his bridge. And so suddenly that felt more TAS. And I, I knew I'd hit where I wanted it to be where I, when I look at the background artwork and it just had that slight like seventies depression kind of feeling to me, <laughs> you know, it was like a little bit depressing. And so I was like, that's where it should be. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, that, 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 again, amazing attention to detail. And uh, so uh, the, the obvious question, I mean, why did you choose this particular scene out of seven seasons of, of mm -hmm. Next Gen that you had to, to pick from? <laughs> People have commented on the video 
and I wish I could take credit for this. They said, oh, it's the best of both worlds of the best of both worlds. That's not hey. what I was. Yeah, see, that's yeah. not what I was thinking of. And of oh, course, no, no, no. It was a Don't happy. OK, that. it's exactly what I was thinking of. This was exactly. always the intention. It was a very yeah. clever idea I had. But but in truth, it was just like I really was thinking, what's a scene that any Trek fan, like a real diehard or a passing one, like the, the best of both worlds, Picard is a Borg, like everybody knows this. So, um, and I wanted a scene that gave opportunities to do like the filmation run and to do like this kind of, you know, action scene kind of thing. So I, that just kind of seemed like I never thought of another, that was the only scene I thought of doing or sequence was that scene. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say I fist bumped when uh, Riker does the, the Kirk animated yep. run yep. towards it's, it's, the book. It's that, it's that filmation <laughs> run. It's like the, the episode of TS we watched last night, Kirk and Spock did it in succession and Lindsay and I started laughing because it's just, yeah. it's so, again, you can watch those, those episodes inside and just take them straight, but also you can step outside and just go, this is really charming and kind of quirky and sometimes kind of funny. So, yeah. Right. I mean, obviously, we really appreciate the time that you've done, that you yeah. spent on the visuals and, and getting this to look like this. But, you, you know, the, the audio is also really important as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, what, what was your approach and process with the with the audio side of this? So I took the original sound from TNG. And I'm sure some people out there kind of know how to do this process. But usually... If you're lucky, music, especially like orchestral music or something like that, it's mixed mostly left and right channel, whereas the dialogue is usually more in the center unless someone's like talking off camera. So yeah. I was able to get a pretty clean extraction of the dialogue and sound effects by extracting the center channel, like the, 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 the waveform that was common between the left and the right. Um, and I'm I'm sure that there are fans out there going right now like oh, there's a 7.1 mix on the Blu-ray you could try to pull that you know I'm sure, I'm sure that's true um, that's a whole other you know thing to do so I I found that the I was able to get it pretty good just off the the um, the audio track I had um, but I still did have to do some manual cleanup like just kind of picking out notes of music and stuff and pulling that stuff out so it still did take a little while to do that and then it was kind of a decision of how many TNG sound effects do I leave in and how many TOS, TAS sound effects do I put in? Yes, because I was going to ask you that because yeah. there's, there's definitely some, as well as the music, there's definitely some TAS or sound effects yeah. in there as well, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of like, yeah, I had to make a decision of where are the universe is because like some TNG sound effects are very of that universe, like, you know, the sound of Worf's console working or whatever. But when the board gets shot by the phaser, I thought, their shield should make a silly noise like that, you know? So I used, it kind of sounds like those, I don't know what the actual sound effect is. I think it might actually be from the Hanna-Barbera library or one of those old sound effects libraries. They would use it a lot on TAS when the computer was thinking, right? You'd have the computer lights flashing and it kind of right. sounds like one of those little kitty toys that you'd push with the little <laughs> balls running around it. I don't know if that's what it is, but something like that, right? So yeah. I just thought, when the when the shield comes up on the Borg drone, the it absolutely should make that kind of sound effect, that very 60s, 70s sound effect. Um, and and also I replaced all the sounds of like when they fall, like when the characters hit the ground. I found like and even the the ship shaking. I think that might have been a Hanna Barbera sound effect. It was one of those old ones, right? So yeah. Oh, it's so perfect. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I really just so thrilled by because like it was something that like made me like, you know, it tickled my brain. And so like it's nice to see that other fans have kind of been equally um, enjoying it and just kind of having a good time with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've 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 given us an hour of your time and I could easily talk to you for an hour more. But uh, Pete, have you got any questions? Because I know I've done a lot of talking here. No, you know, I think uh, uh you guys are very more technical than I am, right? Like I'm, I'm a, a consumer of, of ice cream and enjoyment, right? And I don't dig into it too much. And so I'm just, I'm so thankful that you gave us this great gift and, and uh, uh, thanks for sharing it with the world. Oh, thanks Pete. You know, it really, it really does mean a lot. Like I'm really just so uh, 
amazed by by how much people have liked this and it's wonderful this feels really great cool it, it's so good well um where can uh, if, if people want to see more obviously i'll put the links to this um episode and the and the behind the scenes uh in the show notes down below but if people want to get in touch with gazelle automations or find out more about your work how can they how can they reach you we are um we have a website gazelleautomations.com I, I mean of course we picked a really long name for our company but <laughs> there's a there's a backstory for that we don't have to get into that now but gazelleautomations.com um we're also on all the obvious uh social medias if you search gazelle automations um you'll find it um or you know Lindsay and justin t lee that's our names my wife and i who run the company and uh and again yeah we just our our first major show just came out which is called Meekshi. and you can watch that worldwide it is streaming worldwide on youtube and then in canada it's streaming on tvo kids so that's our first thing that we've ever done like i guess totally on our on our own but uh, we've got a lot of new cool stuff coming out um and i probably should tease this that I may be working on another for fun track thing. Oh, yeah. that's yes, yes yep. that's what we want to know. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Pete, how can people get in touch if they want to? Hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've already found Home Media Minefield. Um, but please check out our podcast. Uh, let's see what's out there. LSWOT cast on all uh, social medias, uh, streaming, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, if you're listening to this, please check out the YouTube channel, Home Media Minefield. Um, and I'm available on Twitter at Too Many E's. Uh, Keith, where can people find you and more of your work? Yeah, well, apart from this channel, I've, I've got another YouTube channel called British Isles, which is E-Y-L-E-S, as in my last name. And on there, I've got some... Uh, films that i've made so uh yeah if you want to see some of that stuff please check that out uh we also want to thank uh neil myers for our wonderful theme music that we use for this show and william mclaughlin for our logo so thank you to those guys as well but that just leads us to thank you justin i really really appreciate you coming on and uh and doing this and thank, thank um, you for having me guys this is super fun and please Thank keep you. us keep us posted as to what other work you've got coming up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All yeah, right. like best to us. Like I so yeah, keep making cool stuff. And uh, yeah, and, uh, oh, I guess I should do the thing. There we go. There yeah, absolutely. let's let's all do it. And uh, whenever you need to talk about enterprise, mm. um, we are here. Cool, cool, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. That's, yeah, that's we, awesome. We, you guys we, met we, over we enterprise. That's the that's game. Cool. Yeah, we'd we'd love to have you on oh, again. Yeah. So, well, yeah, yeah. Anytime you and your wife want to come on, talk about any track, we're happy to talk. Cool, cool. Yeah. Awesome. That's, that that sounds right. great. Yeah. We'll see you next time on Let's See What's Let's Out see There. Let's see what's out there. Bye for now.